survey, state survey prep in service. And the reason that I do it every year is because I don't care if you've been here 25 years or 25 days, um, it's a nice reminder to get in the mode for when the state surveyors show up to survey us. I think one of the important things to know before we get started into this is we call it a state survey and we call them state surveyors because they are state surveyors, but actually they're here to do two surveys. They're here to do a state survey, which is essentially just an HR review of our licensed staff and, and making sure that the in-service training is up to date. The majority of it is a federal survey. Federal government um, has written over the years uh, more regulations for us to follow than nuclear power plants. We are the highest regulated industry in the country. And some of that we deserve from the 1960s when we didn't treat our elders very kindly. Some of it has just gotten out of control. But because of it, we have a lot of regulations to follow. So what the federal government says is to each state, we can't get out to all those facilities and survey, so we're gonna contract with you and you can do it for us. So that's why we call it a state survey when in actuality, it's a federal survey. And the reason why that's important to you is because all skilled nursing facilities surveys federally go up on their website for everyone to view and see how each facility across the country is doing. What is their success or failure rates uh, when the surveyors come to, come to see us? So um, last year there were about 700 pages of new regulations that they implemented. Oh, sorry. Um, we have been busy implementing those things since uh, they started last year. We are in the middle of it now. Uh, what's, what's probably the primary change that you're gonna see this year is um, in the olden days, 20 years ago, surveyors would come into these buildings and they could behave any way they wanted. They could look at anything they wanted, they could have a survey sample, any as large or small as they wanted, they could be here as long as they wanted. Well, facilities screamed and yelled and complained about that. So about five years ago, they reined them back in and said, okay, that's enough surveyors, you're too rogue. Uh, now we're gonna have a computer do it. We have technology now that can tell you what to look at. And so what the surveyors were handed was a laptop that said, here are the residents you're gonna look at, here's what you're gonna look at with each of them, check the boxes, and then leave the building. Your sample size can be this big, you can be in there this many days, and then get out. Well, then the surveyors started squawking and screaming and yelling about that, saying they didn't have any autonomy, saying that they, 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 they didn't, you know, their hands were tied, all of this stuff. So this year, for the first year, they're doing kind of a blended survey, where it's part computer, and then it's part surveyors deciding how to, how to manage it. I'm not gonna read these slides to you, because obviously you can all read. Um, but if you have any questions about anything that I have up there that I don't, that I don't cover, let me know. Um, the, survey, the surveys for long-term care facilities, and I mentioned this because if you come from a hospital background where they have JCO surveys, those are all pre-announced, you know when they're coming, you can get ready for them. Um, skilled nursing facilities um, surveys are always unannounced because they say they wanna come in and get a fresh snapshot of how things are here uh, any other time of the year. So they're always unannounced and they're required to be completed within the ninth and the 15th month of the previous survey. Our survey last year was in mid-October and they were so far behind last year that I uh, boastfully said, I bet we won't see them in 2018. I bet they're gonna wait until January, till that 15th month before they come back again. Well, then lo and behold, the government, the governor gave them more money to hire more surveyors and now they're right back on time. So, um, so we probably will see them about mid-October because what we're hearing is, in fact, they're about a week early to facilities. Uh, they are required to complete their surveys on consecutive work days. In the state of Nebraska, our surveyors work four 10-hour days. So they do not work Fridays. So Friday's kind of our breathe day where we can get things going for what they'll need the next week when they come back on Monday. Um, but so they're generally here on those days, although the federal government also requires of them to start a X number, a certain percentage of their surveys on nights, weekends, and holidays. So last year they started their survey here on a Sunday evening at about five o'clock. That's not, that's not unusual anymore for them to do that, especially because we're a large facility and so they feel like they can get a kickstart on it if they start on a Sunday evening. So they can really come anytime they want. I also mentioned that because if they've gotten a lot of complaints about um, things that happen on night shift or things that happen on the weekend, they will purposefully start their survey on the night 
or on the weekend so they can get their own glimpse of how things are going on those ships. Um, so before they even walk through our door, they've already done a lot of their homework to get ready for our survey. They call it offsite preparation. And a lot of these slides I'm gonna show you are the exact same slides that the surveyors were trained on when they went to Baltimore to get their training on the survey process. So we took exactly what they were trained on and now we're gonna train ourselves on it. So everything that they know, we know. Uh, their offsite preparation, they'll take our, our MDS, our minimum data set assessment that we complete 15 page form on every single resident on admission, a change of condition, quarterly and annually. They will download those into their computers. So before they arrive here, they already have information on every single one of our residents residing here. They know if they have pressure sores, they know if they have weight loss, they know everything on paper about them. Surveyors are gonna review our uh, file of complaints or abuse reports. Anytime we have a resident to resident altercation, a skin tear that we don't know where it came from, a resident fall that results in injury, we have to self-report that to the state of Nebraska. Some, sometimes they'll just look at them, put them in the file, and know that when they come, they'll look at them then. They say that, they say that they're, here to, they're, they're here for their annual survey and complaint survey. And all of our self-reports go into that complaint bucket. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to create another file, so they just throw everything into this bucket that they call complaint survey. So it doesn't surprise us anymore when they say, oh, and we're here on a complaint, because more than likely, it's probably self-reports that we've already self-reported on ourselves. So they'll pull those and look at those. What they're looking for is trends. Uh, do we have a particular resident who's been falling a lot lately? And obviously none of our interventions seem to be working. When they come through the door, they're gonna know that that person's probably gonna be on their sample, as an example. Uh, or do we have our residents had a lot of altercations with other residents? They're gonna see what we're doing for with the behavior plan. And so they're gonna probably pull that resident and we know that resident's gonna be on their survey sample before they even walk through the door. They're also gonna review our, our past surveys. Um, last year we had two deficiencies. Um, state average is six. And we had three deficiencies based on complaint investigations. State average is four, I think. Um, while the Department of Health surveyors are here, the fire marshal, the state fire marshal, is also required to come to do her annual inspection. It either has to be during or immediately following our health inspection. In the olden days, the fire marshal used to come first, and then that was a cue to everybody else that the state was coming. So they said, no, 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 stop doing that, fire marshal. You can't come until we're already on site. Uh, last year, we had six life safety code deficiencies, probably only deserved about two of them, but we're working real hard to kind of get that life safety code thing under control. State average life safety code is four. So um, here are our two deficiencies from the Department of Health last year. We had, a we had a deficiency for dignity and respect, and here was the issue. Residents that use Hoyer lifts to, trans uh, to uh, transfer, um, they sit then on those Hoyer slings, and they said that when a resident's in the dining room or common areas with that, with that Hoyer lift sling exposed, um, it might be a dignity issue. Maybe they don't want all their table mates to know that they have to use a Hoyer lift to be transferred. So now we tuck them in, or we ask the resident's permission if they care. The second deficiency was store, prepare, and serve food in a sanitary manner. Uh, that's the most commonly cited deficiency in the state of Nebraska, probably because there's a lot of things that, that fall underneath that tag, if you want to call it that. What happened in this particular situation is the surveyor watched one of our food service personnel put on gloves, that's fine, she washed her hands, put on gloves, all great so far, and then turned around and opened up a cabinet door with her gloves still on to grab something out of it, tongs or something. Then she went back and grabbed the outside package of a, of a package of hamburger buns, that's also considered dirty, untwisted it, and then reached her hand in with her gloves still on and grabbed a ready to eat hamburger bun. You can't, you can't cross contaminate clean to dirty. Um, had she not touched anything after she gloved up, she would have been okay or if she would have used tongs to grab it, she would have been okay. So they, they considered that cross-contamination and we'll get a deficiency for that every time. So when we were doing our plan of correction back to the state on how we were gonna make sure that didn't happen again, uh, my CEO has said, well, how, how are you gonna correct that? I said, well, I just said that we're not gonna to touch our buns with our bare hands anymore. <laughs> he said, well, I hope you didn't write that. So anyway, well, that's essentially what we're not gonna do anymore. 
We're not going to touch any buns with our bare hands anymore. So there you go. Make sure you don't do that when they're here or anytime. Don't be touching your buns with your bare hands. Um, the other thing that we like to track in general and keep track of is um, what the surveyors are writing across the state. It kind of gives us an idea of what are, their, what are kind of their pet things or their quirks when they go into buildings. And as you can see, store, cook, and serve food in a safe and clean way is, is the number one tag that they write, followed by falls. Um, in an elder care environment, falls are pretty predominant. If, you're not, if you don't have interventions to prevent the falls, uh, that's an easy tag to write. Hand washing. We wash our hands for 20 seconds. Not 10 seconds, not five seconds. Two happy birthdays, I don't care what song you sing. It's 20 seconds. When they ask you how long you wash your hands, what do you say? 20, 20 seconds. seconds. It's 20 seconds. Hand washings is another really easy one to catch because it doesn't just pertain to nursing. It pertains to everyone. They will watch everyone wash your hands. Everyone has to wash their hands. Um, I highlight unnecessary drugs because that was a new regulation that they put into place last year. And look how quickly it, it jumped to the top five deficiencies written. They may have been told by CMS to be watching for unnecessary drugs. What the new regulation is now is you can't have a psychotropic drug on a resident's uh, med order for more than 14 days, uh, an as-needed psychotropic drug, without, without a new physician order for it. So that was a pretty easy one to catch because it's a relatively new uh, regulation that everybody's still getting used to. So we watch for that. Our, far, our consultant pharmacist um, audits that every time she's here. Uh, the medication administration and uh, treatment administration records and labels. Uh, when we reviewed other facilities uh, deficiency reports, what they're actually writing on that is not the accuracy of the med administration record, but the fact that they're finding a lot of pharmacies sending out things that are packaged, like inhalers. And so they have a label on the, on the inhaler box, but then when you pull the inhaler out, there's not a label on the inhaler itself. There has to be two labels so that staff are very clear on what the directions are for that treatment or med. So we're watching for that as well. That's an easy one to miss, especially when you know the residents and you know what, it, what, their, what their order is. It's an easy one to uh, let slip by. You can see the other. Um, so life safety, our life safety code deficiencies, we had six of them. Um, we probably deserved about two of them. Um, on station five, when you, when you exit station five, there was a keypad number that had been worn off. So we replaced that, should have probably noticed it. Um, a new one that's probably been a fire marshal regulation forever, but she had never checked before, was we had to have a lockout uh, tag on our uh, fire alarm system breaker box so that somebody couldn't go down there and flip the switch and turn off our fire alarm system. It sounds, it's smart, but had never been brought up before, so we tied off the fuse, and we probably had it done before she was gone, but still a deficiency. Um, the air handler, there was one test uh, report that we didn't have in our book, so she gave us a deficiency for that, even though they scanned it over to us. Our fire watch policy, we needed to add the phone number to the Department of Health, that that would be one person we would contact, added the phone number before she left, still a deficiency. Um, there were a few doors that didn't latch. A bathroom door and a therapy gym door didn't latch. Um, all of our, with the humidity and the heat and our doors swell, if you run across a door, any door that doesn't latch when you close it, please put a work order into maintenance because our doors have to latch. Those are smoke barrier doors and, and they have to latch. There can't be cracks in them because if the if we would have a fire, those, those doors will prevent smoke from going into resident rooms. So just all, everybody can help check that kind of stuff. And then, um, I'll blame this on hospice, but still our fault. Um, we had two oxygen cylinders that belonged to a hospice care company that they had stuck down in central supply and they weren't in a rack or a chain. And you just can't have random cylinders hanging out different places in corridors or anywhere else. Um, they can turn into a missile and hurt people. So that was probably a deserved deficiency. Um, here, we're, here are kind of the top 10 in the state uh, deficiencies for life safety code. And the only two that we received were the corridor doors, which they obviously seem to write a lot, and the fire alarm system, system testing and maintenance. 
And a lot of times you're reliant on the vendor to get you those reports, but it's still our, it's still our responsibility to babysit them. So. One of the other things that the surveyors will do before they arrive is pull our CASPER report. CASPER just, sa just stands for Certification Survey Provider Enhanced Report. And what it shows them is what have been our deficiencies in the past three years. And what they're looking for is, um, have you had a deficiency two years in a row? Because if you've had a deficiency two years in a row, then you're obviously not fixing it to sustain the correction. You obviously don't have your act together well enough to actually keep it fixed. Now, on the Department of Health side, we've had no repeat deficiencies, which is great. On the Life Safety Code side, we've had five repeat deficiencies, and you can see where they are. I'm going to tell you this. If this year, when the fire marshal comes, there is an oscillating fan that is standing in front of the therapy exit door, I think all of Lancaster County will hear me screaming about it. Because if we do anything right this year with Life Safety Code Survey, we are not going to have exits blocked. <laughs> We can't have exits blocked. It's just an easy thing to avoid. I mean, and obviously if there was a fire, you might just move the fan, but she says it's blocking the exit, so. Twice, twice we've gotten a deficiency because in the therapy gym, we have an oscillating fan blocking the exit. Um, sample selection, I took this from the surveyor training, and for some facilities it might mean something. For us, it doesn't really mean that much because of our size. They're always going to select the maximum sample size. They're always going to select 35 residents. A small building like Holmes Lake Manor, they might only select 10 residents. But we know they're, they're taking 35 residents that are going to be in their survey sample size. And actually, we could probably list who those 35 residents were today based on information that we already have that says who they have to pick. But 35 residents, 70% of it will be generated from the computer based off our MDS assessments. The other 30% will be done after they start interviewing residents. So when they arrive here, um, last year they came on a Sunday at 5 o'clock. And so Cindy Blankenau was the, was the um, house supervisor, and she called and said, State's here. You know, that's the call you love getting while you're out cleaning out your deep freeze. I said, <laughs> oh. Because there's things that they require immediately upon entrance. These are the things they require immediately. So what we have is we have a survey book that we just hand them. Here's everything you need. Immediately, within an hour, within four hours, within 12 hours, within 24 hours. Here you go, surveyors. Get going, get started, let's get out of here. The top three things, we can't get them until they arrive because it changes every day. Our facility census, our new admissions, and our alphabetical listing of residents. So those are the things we actually have to generate after we know they're in the building. So it gets a little hairy sometimes when you don't know they're coming. Um, when they enter, there is no formal tour. In the olden days, they used to walk around with the administrator and DON for about an hour, and we could kind of get our act together a little bit. They don't do that anymore. They're going to go right to uh, their areas. There will be five surveyors. Four of them will go to um, stations one, two, four, and five. Um, they go to the stations where they have the most dependent residents residing. Uh, they generally um, just don't have much to do with station three unless there's been a complaint or unless we've done a self-report on Station 3 because they want to make sure that the residents that they pick for their sample on day one are still here when they leave on day five. And a lot of times with so much activity on Station 3 with coming and going and they are our more independent residents, um, they, they generally just don't do much with Station 3. So four of them will go to Stations 1, 2, 4, and 5. The fifth one will go immediately to the kitchen to do a kitchen observation right away. How does the kitchen look on any given day? They're gonna spend about eight hours that first day just doing um, resident interviews, and then they'll roll into doing a group interview with our resident council. So, uh, how do they pick their 35 residents? Um, they're gonna look at, um, after they do their, their, um, in, their interviews, they're also gonna do a quick closed record review and then go over some other facility tasks. They will entrance with me briefly and ask for the information they need. They'll go to the kitchen and then they'll go to their assigned areas. Um, what they're gonna ask for are new admissions because they're gonna pick some people from there. Um, they're going to um, ask the, the station charge nurses who are their vulnerable dependent residents, any new admissions that they've had on their station in the last 30 days, 
and then any active complaints going on. They used to have to have to stay on script with their questions. We know every single question they're gonna ask our residents. We ask them the same questions. Um, now if they, if they see an issue, like for instance, the resident says, my dentures are loose. Well, they're gonna go to their chart and see, oh, well, have we scheduled a dental appointment? Have, have we, you know, what have we done with that issue? If, if we have addressed the issue, they check the box and move on. If there's no evidence of us even knowing about that issue, then they're gonna dive deeper into it. They're gonna keep asking the residents more questions about that. Um, I hate my roommate. If they go to the complaint log and they see that we know that they hate their roommate, we've, we've moved them to a new room, we can't seem to keep them happy, whatever the case may be, then they'll check their box and move on. Uh, they, they are required to do three um, resident family interviews. So if while they're here, and they'd like to do it early on so they can keep their process moving. So if we know of three families that visit often that love us, <laughs> uh, we would like to steer them in that direction. Wouldn't we, Denise Borden? Yes. Um, so anyway, <laughs> they're required to do three interviews. You're on top of the list, Denise. <laughs> yeah. See, she's convenient. She's here every day. They'll also do a limited record review, but here's what they're required to look at during that. Um, they're required to make sure that advanced directives that residents have are, are available and the staff know what they are. That the staff know who is a do not resuscitate and who isn't. Uh, they're also going to look for things such as pressure sores, infections, and anyone that's attempted to elope in the last 90 days. Their, their resident pool will for sure have residents that are receiving insulin, on an anti anticoagulant or an antipsychotic with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. They're also going to look at PASAR level 2 screened residents to make sure we have behavior interventions in place. Those individuals will more than likely end up on their sample. One of the other newer requirements is that they are required, CMS requires them to observe their first full meal upon their arrival. So if they get here at 815, we know they're going to watch lunch. They get here at 1230, we know they're staying for dinner. We don't have to guess about that. We know they have to. This is what they're doing when they, when they watch their first full meal. Of course, they want to look at you know, atmosphere and environment and make sure there's no infection control violations. But they already know before they get here what residents have had a weight loss of 5% or greater. So they know from the MDS that Lisa has had weight loss of 5% or greater. So when they go to the dining room, they're going to be watching Lisa. They're going to see, is Lisa cued to eat her meal? Does she, does she have her tray sitting in front of her 10 minutes before she gets there, so now it's cold? Is she getting assistance if she needs it with, with, with food? Because why does she have weight loss? One of the first things they're going to look at is Lisa. You know, what's, what's the issue? If they don't see any issues with Lisa, then they'll check their box and move on. If they don't find any issues in their first full dining room observation, and they'll go to at least four of the dining rooms, they move on. If they don't come back for any other meals, that means they didn't have any problems with it and they move on. If they do come back, then obviously we know there's problems in the dining room. Um, they're also gonna do it, they're required to do an unnecessary medication review. They're required to pull five residents and do a full medication review on them. They are going to, their selection process must consider all psychotropic meds, insulin, anticoagulants, opioids, diuretics, antibiotics, as well as any adverse consequences that, is, that have happened uh, because of um, falls, weight loss, or sedation. So if they come in and they see a resident asleep in the main lobby, they're going to consider they're over-medicated. They're probably going to pull that person into their sample. Why are they sleeping at, you know, 10 a.m. 10 a. Uh, out in the front lobby. That's going to be a cue to them to pull that to pull that person in and do a full med review. Uh, they're also, I should tell you this, um, looking for expired medications when they do these reviews. Uh, that's that's what they are required to also look for. With the infection control um, uh, piece of their process, they are also going to pull five residents to make sure that they've received the pneumonia and uh, influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations. Everybody has to have on record if they received it or if they didn't receive it, why they didn't receive it. So they'll check that. 
And then anyone on isolation is, is most likely always going to be on their list. So I think I'm up to about 28 residents by now. So the, they will automatically be on their list. And what they're looking for, does everyone know how to enter and exit the room? Housekeeping, visitors, nursing staff, doesn't matter. Do we make PPE available and do they know how to use it? They'll also do a, um, this is somewhat new as well, the, the depth of what they look at. They ask for all of our new admissions and then they're also gonna ask for our residents who have been discharged off of their Medicare benefits in the last 30 days. And here's what they wanna see. They wanna see that we gave them notice before we discharged them. That's a benefit that the federal government gives the elders of our country. And so we can't just take away that benefit without giving them proper notice first. So they're gonna look at their chart and make sure that all of them are received proper notice before we take them off their Medicare A benefit. So medication administration and medication storage. Um, they're gonna ask for where, where all of our med carts and med storage areas are. When they arrive, we have to give that to them within one hour. They will immediately go to those med rooms and all they're checking the carts for is expired medications. That's all they're doing, digging through those, those carts. Uh, they are also going to watch med administration. They have to observe 25 med administrations. They have to be by different routes, units, and shifts. If someone is receiving their medication via a tube, they will absolutely be on the list. They, want to, they love to watch that, love to watch it. So they may pick on one nurse, they may pick on two or three different nurses, but please have empathy for those nurses because it can be <laughs> intense having them with their laptop <coughs> making notes through every single administration of a med. Uh, huh? No, I would, we're gonna talk about that a little later. I wouldn't do that. Um, the resident council meeting, um, there's, they can ask them anything they want. There's two questions they're required to ask. The federal government tells them they have to ask them about abuse. Have you ever been abused in the facility? And um, adequate staffing. When you put on your call light, is it answered timely? Those are the two questions they're required to ask during resident council meetings. I love this quote. Um, it says, every system is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results it gets. So we're prepared and organized and have a well-oiled machine. We're good to go. We're gonna have a successful survey. We're scrambling around. We don't have our act together. Nobody knows where to get stuff that they need. They're gonna get frustrated. We're gonna have a bad outcome. We already know right now what they want from us. So why wouldn't we get everything together for them so that they can do their job. They're here to take a snapshot of the job we do. We need to make sure that we make it as easy as we can for them to do their job. I also like to say that we control our own destiny. Uh, we know every single question that they're gonna ask our residents. So we ask our residents the exact same questions. We don't, always, we don't only do that so that our residents are used to the questions they're gonna ask. We also do it because we wanna know the feedback that, that, that they give us. And we, we learn something every single time we ask someone a question, staff or resident. So in June, we asked our residents um, the same, those same questions that surveyor asked, and here's what they said. 31 residents were asked on station one. They were interviewed by our team. 39% uh, of them said they don't get a choice regarding the bath times or showers or baths, you know, one or the other. We asked um, person-centered care questions on purpose because we were focused in on that. We wanted to make sure that that was all addressed. So we weren't surprised to see such a high number respond negatively to that question, but it gave us a chance to go in and address it at each of their care plan meetings, which we've been doing since June. 29% said food was not served at proper temps. So it was too cold at dinner. When we started looking into that, we found out that the plate warmer was getting unplugged. And so of course the food is not gonna be as hot as we would like it, but it was an easy fix. But that's something that we continue to monitor. 19% um, of the people thought that six of the residents thought the room lacked cleanliness. Station two, we did 25 surveys. Again, 24% said the food is not served at proper temps. 20% said the building was not clean. Here was an interesting one that we found out in June. 16% of the residents on station two said they cannot have visitors past nine o'clock. We thought that's strange. You can have visitors whenever you want. Now, in our, in our resident handbook, we do say our residents prefer 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. because that's generally our residents' wake hours. But a visitor can obviously be here at 9 o'clock. What we found out when we started asking our questions about that was there was an announcement being made overhead at 9 o'clock that said, get out. And more politely than that, 
but they were essentially saying visitor hours are over get out and um, so our residents were upset by that well we got that stopped right away after we knew it but if we wouldn't have asked the question we may have never ever known that was going on so it was a great thing to ask because we were able to change a practice or a process because of it as an example simple things but um, nice things to know uh, we do we did not survey station three or station five because station three's population changes so quickly in and out and on station five we just didn't have enough interviewable residents so on station four we interviewed 22 people probably the most disheartening uh, feedback that we got of all the surveys we did was 41 percent of the residents said that staff do not treat them with dignity and respect and you hate hearing that and whether it's whether it's true or not true that's the perception and so we immediately kicked in some um, speak education for the staff on on what's our speak what do we say to residents that make them believe that um, what are some interventions one of the things that social service did as a result of that was they they developed these coping books they're pink manuals and they're at every station they maybe only have like four to six residents each in them right now. But for some of our um, tougher residents that have escalating behaviors, um, there's a coping strategies sheet in there. Things that work, that work with other staff, things to try if it seems like a, their behavior is escalating and you don't know what else to do to help them. And, and we're hoping that that helps with some of the interaction and some of the negative vibe that our residents are getting about us treating them with respect and dignity. 32% said the food doesn't taste good. That's when we made the decision to move a steam table back up to station four to try to get some of those issues resolved. And 23% have or had missing items. Um, here's, here's the other thing. Ethel lost her red sweater five years ago. Uh, every single time you ask Ethel, does she have anything missing or stolen? She'll say yes, a red sweater. Now. If it's on our, our lost articles log and we can show that we knew about Ethel's red sweater and we resolved that we replaced it or we found her a similar one and she's happy now, great. They check their box, they move on. If they're coming up to us the first time and say, oh uh, yeah, Denise said she lost her watch. And we're like, oh, she did? And, and the surveyors are the first ones to tell us about that. What the surveyors are going to assume is we must not have good processes in place to receive and address complaints from residents. Residents either don't feel comfortable telling us or we're not asking. So they know that in a building this size, things are going to get misplaced. They're not naive to that. What they want to see is that when something does get misplaced, that we're addressing it in a timely fashion. So that's why I wanted to bring up that one. So we also then had our nurse consultants come in, our corporate nurse consultants come in in August and do a mock survey. So they went through every single regulation and said, we believe if the surveyors came tomorrow, here would be some of your issues. And this is pretty recent, this was mid-August. I'm not gonna read this to you, but I do wanna point out a few things. Several of our residents said they had no privacy during baths, that they're naked in a bathtub and staff come in to get supplies, staff come in to get the trash, staff are just coming in and leaving. When I'm living here and I'm naked in a bathtub, please don't come in and bother me. I don't know if any of you would like that, if someone walked into your bathroom when you were naked, but our residents don't like it. So be very mindful to keep private areas private. The other thing I want you to be really careful about is the knock and go. I tell this story all the time, I don't care, I'm gonna tell it again. A lot of our residents have lived in the same home for 50, 60 years. Five bedroom, two story, loved it. And then because of their health or other things, they come here to, to lend, live the end of their life. And we give them a space about this big. And we say, this is your new home now. This is where you're gonna live. This space, right here. That's all you get. And then we don't even have enough decency to, to give them the privacy to say, yeah, this is my space. Le at least let me control that. At least let me control my space by inviting you into my home. Other than my five-year-old neighbor boy, nobody else just busts into my house on a random basis. Everybody else rings the doorbell and, and, and I greet them and, and ask, invite them into my home. We all do that. So please, we need to be respectful of our residents' environment and not just knock and go, or worse than that, not even knock. 
just go. Um, just be, be aware of that. Uh, we had two residents. Um, one didn't receive um, assistance in the dining room that she asked for, and the other one slept through lunch. Sometimes when you're here every day and you know, oh yeah, Gladys always sleeps through lunch. Well, why is she in the dining room sleeping through lunch? That's something we probably need to address. Uh, there were housekeeping and med carts unlocked and unattended. Dietary had stacked wet trays, bowls, and glasses, still wet, and there were dirty bowls clean in the clean area next to the tray line. There were dirty linen bags in the corridors and in the rooms, just lined up. Not only is it an odor issue, it's an infection control issue. Uh, hand washing, it was not long enough and not frequent enough. We wash our hands for 20 seconds. That's how long we wash our hands is 20 seconds. 20 seconds is that long. And then one of the other things that we learned that was great to know is that they didn't feel like we had good enough tools for our non-English speaking residents. So we created communication boards that are in all of our resident rooms where English is not their primary language. So look for those when you're in those rooms. There, there are just a communication tools for us to better identify what a resident might need from us. When the surveyors are here, obviously they're gonna make sure that we're knocking on doors and we have curtains pulled during per performance of cares. They're gonna make sure we have call lights within reach and answered promptly, that residents aren't leaning over their wheelchairs or, or you know, otherwise. Grooming's appropriate and that um, they're unrestrained. For the environmental tour, those same 35 residents that they choose will be the same 35 rooms that they look at. They're gonna check maintenance, upkeep, overall cleanliness, they're gonna check water temps and make sure lighting's adequate. When they are in the food service department, uh, they are going to need to watch a meal prep from start to finish. And when they say from start to finish, they mean when you pull the chicken out of the freezer until it enters a resident's mouth. Don't try to trick them and start early. They will just get irritated because they have to now come back and watch another meal prep. When they say, tomorrow I wanna, ma I wanna watch you prep you have the pureed lunches. Don't start pureeing it until they get there because that's what they have to watch. They have to check their box. Um, they're also going to watch dining room observations and staff interactions. Do staff talk over residents about what they did last night or are they engaged with the residents? Um, some of their triggered areas that they're obviously going to look for are any complaints that are made during the interview, any resident that has weight loss, Making sure therapeutic diets are, are followed, if somebody's on thickened liquids, that they're getting it. And, and any pressure sores interventions that our RDs are, are, are helping with, or helping with wound healing. They're gonna wanna make sure that the RDs are involved in that with anyone that has a pressure sore. That's a trigger for them. Infection control, the surveyors themselves will tell you that that is the most common and easiest deficiency to cite. And they're really only looking at two things. We wash our hands, and how do we handle, store, process, and transport linen? Linen must be covered when it's transported, and you cannot carry linen against your uniform. Your uniform is considered dirty. So if you grab linen like this to go down the hallway, all of that linen is dirty, and you need to dump it back down the chute. You can't put it on a clean bed. So make sure when you're transporting linen that you're not making it dirty in the process of transporting it. So what do the surveyors want from us? Pretty easy. They want us to be organized for their arrival and efficient with, with the request for information. Ignoring their request for information will not make it go away. It just will irritate them and make them stay longer. Uh, they want accurate information, so please do not tell them anything that you do not know to be fact. This is the worst time to develop a symptom of word vomit. Do not start word vomiting all over them. If you do not know the answer to a question, um, just tell them. I'll have to go check on that and get back to you, or that would, be, that would be a good question to ask my supervisor. Don't start making stuff up because you think that you're supposed to know the answer to it. Okay, fair? And then be professional, but don't be sarcastic. Now is not the time for you to try out being a comedian. They don't know you, they don't know that you're the funny guy of the building. All they want is courtesy, uh, you know, obviously be cordial with them, uh, but we don't need to be sarcastic with them. Early on in my uh, administrative career, they asked a staff member what they would do in case of fire. The staff member said, oh, I'd run like hell. Ha <laughs> ha, super funny, until it showed up in our final report that, you know, Denise Borton stated I would run like hell. 
for all the world to see. All of our, all of our surveys go up on the internet. Everybody can read it. So just be careful with what you're telling the surveyors because while they're typing, they're quoting everything you're saying. Um, and here's, here's why it's important for us to be prepared for them. Um, they're here for five days to take a snapshot of the care and services we provide 365 days a year. So, and all the world's going to judge us on what these five days look like. Now, it's not going to look like Disneyland. It's not, because we're not perfect. But we want it to be our best. We want to put our best foot forward. So we want to help each other out and make sure that it goes well and help them out and make sure it goes well. So how are we going to prepare for this? We're going to do the exact same things they do. They do resident interviews, we do resident interviews. They do staff interviews, we do staff interviews. Family interviews, observations, we're going to do exactly what they do to make sure that we're ready for it so that we don't miss anything. We're also going to do dining room observations, infection control audits, kitchen and food service observations, medication reviews, uh, the pharmacist is here to always do our pharmacy reviews. Here's one thing that they're going to ask staff that I want to make sure I cue you in on. They're going to ask you, what would you do if you saw two residents having an altercation? What would you do? Stop it. Thank you. You'd intervene. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear that every single person in this building knows to intervene. A lot of times what they hear is I'd, I'd tell my supervisor, well, the residents are still beating themselves up. So let's make sure that we stop them from doing that first before we go tell our supervisor. And they want to know that we've trained our staff that everyone's free and willing and able to intervene and stop that from happening. Most importantly, I always say we're going to hang together. This is not a survey of the nursing department. This is not a survey of the food service department. This is our Lancaster Rehabilitation Survey. So if you walk by and you see a housekeeping cart that has chemicals on top of it and no one around, stick them back underneath the cart. You walk by and you see that Lisa's been followed by a surveyor all day watching Med Administration, then let's help build Lisa up. Because you never know who they're going to pick on, uh, but we got to make sure we're supporting each other. We are, we, are a, we are a team in this process. 